Vaping can be quite the controversial topic and even confusing at times. Now we actually did a video on vaping about two years ago where a lot of these debates and questions came up. So in today's video, we're gonna reiterate some of these questions and these debated topics by discussing the risks of vaping, certain lung conditions associated with vaping, as well as talk about if anything has changed over the past two years about what we do and don't know about vaping. And of course, we'll have to have a little talk about how vaping compares to traditional cigarette smoking. It's gonna be an important one. So let's do this. So let's start by revisiting the first big question. Is vaping bad for you? Well, I think we can definitely say that vaping is not going to improve your health, especially the health of these little beauties, the lungs. But the overall consensus from the medical community is that vaping is not worth the potential risks. And we're gonna go over these potential risks in just a second. But even though the overall consensus is that vaping should be avoided, the point of this video is not to say that people that do vape are bad, because frankly, after working with patients for years now, and I can even throw myself into this, we all could make improvements in our lifestyle choices and improve what we put into our bodies in order to optimize our health. And we're gonna talk a little bit about health optimization in this video, but let's get into these actual risks when it comes to vaping so that we can all make informed decisions and create our own personal risk assessment. One of the main known short-term risks of vaping is still a lung condition called e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury or what we're just gonna call e -volley. Now in certain situations, this could be quite severe and even life threatening. And this really started to be noticed around 2019 when patients were coming in with cough, shortness of breath, chest pain, fever, headache, dizziness, and sometimes even vomiting and diarrhea. Now many of these symptoms were similar to symptoms that somebody might experience with a lung infection like pneumonia. And in certain situations, many of these patients were initially thought to have pneumonia, but, Unlike pneumonia, EVALI is not caused by a pathogen, but rather induced by vaping. However, the exact mechanism of how and why vaping induces EVALI is still not entirely clear. So there were studies done where many patients underwent a procedure called a bronchoalveolar lavage. Now this is typically done with a bronchoscopy or a bronchoscope, which is a tube that has a camera on it. And they would take that tube down the trachea and into the bronchi and then go deeper down into the airways so that they could visualize the airways and then they would inject a saline solution. And this is the lavage part where they would essentially wash the airways and gather a sample. And what they found in many of these samples with patients with Evali was quite interesting. 94% of patients with Evali in one particular study were found to have THC and vitamin E acetate as part of their bronchoalveolar lavage samples. Now they did find other substances at lower and varying degrees things like nicotine, CBD oils, and other plant oils, and even certain heavy metals like nickel, tin, and lead. But because of the strong correlation of vitamin E acetate and THC, that caused the CDC and other health organizations to recommend against vaping, in particular with products or cartridges that contain vitamin E acetate and THC. Now, this was the stance of these organizations two years ago when we did our original video, and today, these organizations still haven't really changed their stance. So now we need to have a little bit of a checkpoint because as we learned from our previous video in the comments or what we'll refer to as constructive feedback, people can get quite protective with their THC consumption. They don't seem to care as much about the vitamin E part, but the THC can be very protective. And in all seriousness, people did bring up some valid questions and points regarding this connection of THC and Evali in this type of lung injury. So I think it's fair for us to address it in a couple of different ways. First, none of the studies that we've mentioned in this video or the previous video have stated that THC or vitamin E acetate are the definitive causes of EVALI, but rather it was due to that strong correlation of 94%, plus a lot of the long-term possible unknown effects of vaping that caused many of these organizations to recommend avoidance with vaping with some of these particular ingredients that we've mentioned. And speaking of ingredients, many will state that it is the other ingredients rather than the THC or the vitamin E that are to blame for the negative outcomes of vaping and Evoli. And they'll often cite like lower quality vaping sources or vaping cartridges from unknown sources that could potentially contain contaminants or ingredients that are contributing to these problems. 
And these concerns are actually worth exploring. In one particular study of 573 individuals affected with Evali, the majority of these people reported getting vaping products from illicit off the street sources or from informal sources like friends and family. And others even reported that they created their own homemade liquid that they added to previously used cartridges. Did some of the patients in this study with a volley report getting their vaping products from more reputable, I guess more vetted sources? Yes, but you can see how this totally muddies the water with all these particular vaping products from different sources with potential different ingredients or contaminants that could contribute to possible negative outcomes of vaping. So that gives us a bit of information to digest with one of the main short-term risks of vaping, that risk of developing Evoli. And we're gonna come back to this in THC and the other ingredients, but for us to kind of put the whole picture together with vaping, we have to look a little bit further down the road with some of the long-term potential risks. One of the main long-term concerns with vaping is how it's affecting the younger population, those that are in middle school and high school. And at the end of 2022, the FDA and the CDC released data that estimated one in 10 or 2.5 million people in those age groups were utilizing e-cigarettes or some sort of vaping products. Yes, there is concern that they could potentially develop Evoli in the short term, but many of the vaping products also contain things like nicotine. So there's concerns for developing long-term dependence or addiction, and also potentially creating a gateway to trying other things. Or in other words, could this increase their risk of maybe wanting to try something like traditional cigarettes? And speaking of traditional cigarettes, let's talk about two things. One, how do they compare as far as which one's better, which one's worse? And two, is vaping a viable option in order to help one quit smoking? The overall consensus is that vaping is less harmful than traditional cigarette smoking. And even though we spent some time talking about how the vaping products and cartridges can have a bit of variability in their ingredients, it's still thought that they contain less harmful chemicals and less carcinogens than that which can be found with traditional cigarettes. So does this mean that vaping could be used as a viable option to help someone quit smoking traditional cigarettes? Well, there are some studies that imply that it possibly could be. And there have been people that have quit smoking by utilizing vaping, but there are some concerns with this. One of the main hesitations from the medical community of actually labeling vaping as a potential viable option for smoking cessation is that we still don't know the long-term effects of vaping. Yes, we do believe that it's less harmful than traditional cigarette smoking, but how much less harmful? We still don't know. We have so much data on traditional cigarette smoking and just not nearly as much with vaping that frankly, we just need more time to see what these long-term effects are going to be. Now, to build upon that, Many of the critics of saying vaping should be used as a viable option for smoking cessation would say, hey, if there's other effective tools out there to help someone quit smoking that don't involve inhaling a substance into your lungs, shouldn't those options be considered first? And another concern is that there are people who will attempt to use vaping to quit smoking traditional cigarettes and it doesn't end up working and then they end up using both and becoming dual users. Now, you could make the argument that that vaping or some of that vaping is taking the place of some of the more harmful cigarette smoking. But the whole point of using the vaping in the first place in this scenario was to quit smoking cigarettes entirely. So if someone is going to use vaping to help them quit smoking, then again, the ideal situation would be to go from smoking to vaping to using neither one. Now I have talked to people and even had some patients that have said, hey, I'm gonna use vaping to quit smoking, but I'm gonna keep vaping afterwards. So that brings us to this next point of if people want to continue to vape or still choose to vape after smoking, or maybe they never smoked in the first place and just want to continue vaping indefinitely, what are some things that you should consider? First, using vaping products from reputable companies to help minimize the variability in ingredients, possible contaminants, or harmful chemicals. This also brings us back to vitamin E acetate and THC. And I should probably mention this because some people might be wondering, what is the deal with the vitamin E acetate? Well, in this case, vitamin E is used as an additive to help dilute cartridges that most often contain THC. So those two ingredients are most commonly paired together, which can also make it a little bit tricky when we're trying to tease out what is kind of that correlation versus causation with a volley. Could it be possible that if you could get rid of one versus the other and you would reduce your risk of having lung injury that we talked about earlier? But another thing to consider with THC is that 
from the perspective of the United States, the majority of states actually have not legalized recreational use of THC. So that could make it very difficult for someone to use a reputable company in, say, a state that has not legalized this substance, and they might be more likely to get their THC containing products or their vaping products with THC from a less than reputable off the street source, which could also increase the risk of possible contaminants or harmful chemicals. But something important to note, in areas where THC has been legalized, there are companies that are currently manufacturing THC containing vaping products without the addition of vitamin E acetate. Now, although the CDC has not updated their current recommendations, emergency department visits related to vaping have actually been on the decline. The reason for the decline is likely multifactorial, but the CDC does concede that removal of vitamin E acetate from many products may be contributing to this decline. But before any major changes are made, more research does need to be done. So again, because of these variables and correlations, if someone is going to vape, it is still the recommendation of the CDC and other health organizations that vaping with these ingredients should be avoided. Now, I'm certain that there will still be many of the strong opinion that THC or vaping with THC is not contributing to a volley or any of these possible long-term negative effects of vaping. And that's okay. We might find in the future with more research that vaping with THC isn't a strong contributor to these problems or potential long-term negative effects. But we also might not find that out. But the future and the unknown is kind of the last main point we need to touch on. It's very difficult with all of these unknowns in the future and long-term possible effects of vaping to make an effective personal risk assessment with vaping. We're kind of playing a game of Russian roulette with a different set of unknown rules. Is it a pellet or a BB or a 22 gauge size bullet? We're pretty certain that it's a smaller bullet than the smoking bullet, but the exact size, how many bullets, and if and when it's gonna go off is unknown. So because of these variables and unknowns, this probably isn't gonna be a shocker to you, but I believe that vaping should be avoided altogether as it's not worth the potential risks. Now, we spent a lot of time during this video talking about what we don't know. So let me leave you with something that I do know. And that is these amazing structures or organs, these human lungs that you're seeing here, were not designed for vaping, smoking, or any of that. So anything that interferes with the optimal functioning of these organs or interferes with optimizing our long-term health I think we should strongly consider taking that off the table. So hopefully all of this information gave you some new insights on vaping. If you have some thoughts or questions, please post them in the comments below. If you have different opinions, please don't hesitate to post those in the comments below because I think we can all learn from communicating and talking with people who think differently and have different opinions on different subjects. But if you don't mind me shifting gears a little bit here, I do wanna see if you can help me with a little bit of a problem or a problem solving question or pop quiz question from the sponsor of today's video. Let's pretend you live in the middle ages and you're part of a kingdom where you are in charge of the coins. One day the queen requests four coins, but the night before a thief broke in and essentially leaves a note that says one of the coins could be fake. And all you have is a scale and one coin that you know for sure is real for reference. So the question is, how many times do you need to use the scale to find whether a coin was taken or not? Well, you can find this answer and many more by visiting the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant.org is an amazing interactive online learning platform for STEM subjects. It's one of the best places to learn math, science, and computer science. I personally use Brilliant still to this day as I find it fun and interactive yet challenging enough to keep my attention. And some of my favorite courses are the ones on scientific thinking as these can help you to improve problem solving skills and apply logic to real world situations. Brilliant is also constantly adding new lessons each and every month. So you'll definitely find something for you regardless of where you are on your educational journey. So if you're interested, go to brilliant.org slash IHA to get a free 30 day trial. Plus the first 200 people will get 20% off their annual subscription. We'll also include that information in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching everyone. Like and subscribe if you feel the need and we'll see you next time.